So let's pray now. Father God, we, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have as believers to come before your throne to find grace, to help, and mercy in time of need, which is what we have right now. This is a time of need for Saeed, for his family, for Nagme, for the kids. Lord, we ask that you would bring him home. First and foremost, Lord, we ask that he could come home because to us, he's been there long enough. But every day he's there is another day that you want him to be there, and he is a witness for you at all times, and his light is shining in a very dark place. That's when light shines the best is in the dark. We ask for you to protect him, to heal his body from the beatings and the torture and the the poor nutrition. Keep him, Lord, from suffering from any depression that may try to seek in, that maybe you've forgotten him. Let him know that not only has the world not forgotten him, so many people, but you mostly have never forgotten him. Even if all of us did, you don't. But we do ask for him to be able to come home. We know Nagme and the kids want him desperately, and we would love to see that reunion happen. So we leave it in your hands. We know that you're watching him, that you have plans for him. Maybe there's one person You're waiting to come to faith before he comes home. We pray that that man would give in, or woman, whoever it is. And now, Lord, as we look to your word, we want to hear from you. We're excited to hear from you. That's why we've come, is to worship you and to be ministered to by you. So our faith will grow because it comes from hearing the word of God, and we're going to hear some of that today. So thanks, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 22. So we're picking it up. This is the last week of Jesus' life. This is probably, well, this is early in the week. So we'll pick up in verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says of you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. So I call this message Passover prep. Not really that clever, but pretty explanatory. So verse 1, now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. This is when the Jews celebrated their independence from Egypt. It's kind of like our 4th of July. You know, we have a big celebration, light fireworks, barbecue, day off from work for most of us. So that's kind of what they did. And there were millions of people that we call pilgrims, meaning they didn't live in Jerusalem, but they came there for the festival, crowded in and around Jerusalem during the week, and that caused the Romans to be nervous about possible uprisings. Because during the Passover, people had politics on their minds, and it would be the perfect time for a would-be Messiah to come in and try to overthrow Roman rule. Because there's a thing called crowd mentality. Get a bunch of people together, they're kind of excited about independence. Hey, let's get independence again. Let's do it again. They're letting us celebrate. Why not just run them out and we can celebrate when we want? Whatever. And one person will rise up, maybe it could happen. So the Romans were nervous. And that would explain why King Herod and Pontius Pilate were in Jerusalem instead of being at Tiberias and Caesarea where they normally would live and rule from. They both came into Jerusalem because they needed to be there personally to help keep the peace, which also explains why there were so many extra Roman soldiers in town. Normally they didn't have that many. You ever go to a concert? They hire security. They'll have police outside. You go to a a Boise State football game. You get out of the game. You're walking out of the stadium. There are police there. They've got flares. They've got cones. They're directing traffic. They're not there seven days a week, but they're there when the people are there. So the people are here, and the Romans are there in extra numbers, especially with the uh, soldiers. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this goes all the way back to the book of Exodus, and we see it found in chapter 12, verse 15. It says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, 
which is yeast. If you put yeast in bread, it rises. You know, if you don't put yeast in bread, it's flat. So that's pretty simple. On the first day, you will remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So Israel had an interesting way that they celebrated and observed this Feast of Unleavened Bread. For a month before, every synagogue, not just in Jerusalem, because Jerusalem had the temple itself, but all of Israel, they would teach the meaning of the Passover as a subject for the teaching in every synagogue for an entire month. In every house, just two days before the Passover, they performed a ceremonial search for leaven. And it was pretty cool because the householder would take a candle and he would solemnly and quietly search every cabinet. They'd open the door and they'd look around with the candle and the kids would be right there and they'd make sure there was no leaven in the whole house. And this is cute. They would leave some leaven here and there for the kids to find. So the kids could go, Dad, look, look. And then they would take it and they would remove it from the house. And this engages the kids. This gets the kids involved in the story. So then when they grow older and have their own children, they would do the same thing to remember to remove all leaven. Now, why did God have them remove all the leaven from their houses? Well, I don't know if you know this, but leaven in Scripture is a picture of sin. And God hates sin. And why does God hate sin? Because it's so destructive to us. He loves us. He knows sin is destructive, so of course he hates sin. Even in a small amount. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So if you ever have a a lump of dough and you mix leaven in, if you have the lump of dough compared to how much yeast you put in, it's very small. And you mix it in and it permeates the whole thing. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be, that you may be a new lump. (laughs) You ever thought of yourself as a lump? (laughs) Some of us do. Others are like, I think I'm the best looking lump, but yeah, okay. So, you you know, the nickname, y'all got a new nickname today, right? Lumpy. There you go. But the reason you remove and become a new lump, because you truly are unleavened. Because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, sin no longer has a hold on you, and it has been removed by forgiveness. I mean, we still sin. We come to him and ask for forgiveness, and he sees us as faultless. So it's amazing. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wonder this. I wonder how our lives would be. Would they be any different if on a regular basis we were to search every nook and cranny of our hearts and minds for any form of leaven or sin and remove it on a regular basis? What would our lives be like? be amazing. I really think we would be a lot more godly. Then there's the term, the Passover. We had the Feast of Unleavened Bread and then the Passover. This was also first observed in Egypt while the Hebrews were still slaves. It goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 2. What happened was, actually in one, Moses was born, and it was during a time when there was a pharaoh that realized, wow, there are a lot of these Israelites here. Not a pharaoh, but yeah, the king. And so anyway, so he, there are a lot of uh, Egypt, or Israelites here, so let's kill off all the babies they have that are male. They need to be killed. Well, Moses' mother um, didn't do that. She put him in a basket, and he floated down the river, right? You remember that? Kind of like the ark, in a way. Floated down the river. And who found him? Pharaoh's daughter was bathing down by the river, and she saved him, and God worked it out to where Moses' sister was there. Oh, shall I go get a woman to, um, to nurse him? Oh, yes, would you please? So she went and got his own mother. So his own mother got to nurse the baby that's supposed to be killed. Where? In Pharaoh's house. I mean, I just love the way God works all this out. The one who says, these will all be killed, and then he's raised in their house. It's so cool. So now Moses is 40 years old, and he knows that God has revealed to him that he needs to, he's going to be this deliverer, and he sees a Hebrew being beaten by an Egyptian. So he looks this way and that way. There's nobody there. Goes over there and he killed the Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. It's not a good idea to bury things in the sand, by the way, if you want to keep them hidden for very long. Because the next day, he sees 
two Hebrews fighting. And he comes up to break it up, and one guy, I mean, this is a loose paraphrase, basically says, who died and made you God? You, what, are you going to kill one of us like you killed that Egyptian? And Moses says, surely this thing is known. And the Hebrew says, yes, it is, and don't call me Shirley. <laughs> but anyway, he says, surely this thing is known. And then Pharaoh found out that Moses had killed an Egyptian, and he got upset and wanted to take it out of Moses, kill him. So Moses ran away. If you saw the movie The Ten Commandments, Pharaoh evicted him, sent him out, back, cast him out of Egypt. No, Moses ran away. And I'm not picking on Moses. That's just the fact of it. You know, you see it. He's got the staff, a little bit of food, and the one, I guess today we call him, what, a boda bag, a little leather bag, you know, with water in it. That's not enough water for him. Ha, ah, he'll be fine. So anyway, so he lives now for 40 years out in the desert. So now he's 80 years old. Then he's seen the burning bush, and God calls him and talks to him and tells him he's going to be the deliverer. I am sent you. All these things have happened. But now he, what's happening? We pick it up in Exodus 2, 23 through 25. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. So that king has died. Another one has come along. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. So God heard their cries, and he saw how they were being mistreated. He still does the same thing today. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't confuse what you see as a perceived lack of God of action by God in your life as a sign that he doesn't see you, that he doesn't hear you, or he doesn't know anything about what's going on in your life. He sees you, he hears you, and he knows all about what's going on. And he will act at the perfect time in the perfect way that brings glory to him. That's what he's waiting for. Remember, the Hebrews were in slavery for over 400 years. Is it possible that what you're going through is a little less time than that? Probably so. So anyway, what did God do about the mistreatment of his people in Egypt? He saw it, he heard it, he knew it was going on. So he sent the deliverer, Moses. And then God sent 10 plagues on Egypt when Pharaoh refused to let the people go because Moses went in to see him and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh rhymed and said, no. <laughs> so each plague was used by God to show that their gods were false. Each plague was an attack on a god or gods the Egyptians had. I don't know if you know that, but it's true. And here's what the plagues were. And the reason those gods were false, by the way, is because they don't even exist. But the plagues were, number one, the Nile River turned to blood. Imagine that. Just think about Indian Creek, let alone some great, like the Mississippi River in our country. All of a sudden, it's turned into blood. And all the fish die, and they rise up to the top, and they stink. And then the second one, the, the plague of frogs. And you think, I kind of think, you know, boys, frogs are cool. Not if they're all over the place, everywhere. You step outside, you slip and fall. But you don't get hurt because you land on frogs. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're everywhere. And then eventually they died, and then they scooped them up and put them in piles, and it says the land stank. So the, obviously that would be a bad plague. And then there's the plague of lice after that. And the lice were so thick, and they stuck to the skin of the people, and they stuck to the plants, and they stuck to the ground. Lice are creepy. I think we all agree with that. Bugs, ugh. They've got those little legs that they grab you with and everything. Yeah, I'm just, everyone's going, ew. I'm trying to drive home the point that this is ew. <laughs> and then the plague of flies. And you think, I can deal with flies? Really? Where you, every time you take a breath, a fly goes in your mouth because there's so many? I mean, we all have, you've seen those strips, right? The sticky strips of like fly paper, and you hang them up. My wife hates those, but I love them because every time I see them, their flies run there, and I go, ha ha, you're not bugging me anymore. You know, I hate it. And that's like, you know, I might count up to 20 or 30. How about so thick that it's like a cloud of flies? Oh, by the way, after the lice, because the, the, the Israelites were living in the land of Goshen, part of Egypt, after the lice, none of the plagues that came affected them. So God kept them safe from the plagues, even though the plagues came upon Egypt. Another miraculous thing that God did. Then there was the death of all the livestock. It was prophesied God would kill all the animals unless they brought them inside. Some of them did, most of them didn't, and they died. And then there were boils on man and beast, the sixth plague, that were so bad that the magicians always came before Pharaoh and tried to duplicate the plague, which I thought was funny right there. 
It's like, we have lice. Boom, let's make more lice. Okay, great. Can you get rid of the lice? <laughs> Why would you duplicate that? Big deal. We have flies, you have more flies. We have frogs, you make more frogs. How about reversing that? They couldn't. All they could do is do... Anyway, it's just, to me, it's so funny. But then the boils were so bad, they couldn't even stand before Pharaoh because they were in such pain. Boils on man and beast. Now, here's... Number seven is an amazing one. There is hail that comes down, destroying crops, destroying plants, destroying anything outside, mingled with fire. How do you have hail and fire? You think the hail will put out the fire. You think the fire couldn't even exist. But, hey, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. So there's hail and there's fire that runs along the ground and burns things. You're starting to get the idea that Egypt was kind of ruined by these plagues. I mean, totally. Then the plague, number eight, of locusts. Basically, large grasshopper type things, you know, flying in and eating whatever was left that the hail and everything else didn't ruin. Now, these locusts, you might think of grasshoppers today, but the Bible says not really because it says they were unlike any locusts that were before them and unlike any locusts that will be after them. So whatever they were, they were a one-time deal. God created them just for that, and then they were gone. So they were really bad, really bad. And then number nine was the plague of darkness. And the Bible says in this case, it's darkness which may even be felt. Have you ever been in darkness, that kind of dark? I mean, you can be in a room like if this room, if we turned off all the lights, we can't turn off all of them because the exit signs stay lit. But you'd think, man, it's dark in here. But after a couple of minutes, your eyes would adjust. But I've been out in what's called Cuna Cave, which is where the whole caveman thing came from. And they used to go out, be able to go out to Higby Cave, but I guess they closed that. You can walk in Cuna Cave. You have to climb down a ladder that's only welded on one corner. It's going, whoa, it's really fun. But anyway, so you climb down, and you get back in there, and you kind of go up and around like this, and you get to where no light comes in. I mean no light. You, whatever light you have, you bring with you. Well, my wife took a bunch of Girl Scouts on a field trip, and, of course, my son and I had to go along to chaperone. We just wanted to play in the cave. And we were way in the back, a lot farther back than they were, and I turned off the flashlight. And it was black, black. I mean, it was, you couldn't see a thing. You put your hand up there, and the only way you knew it was there is your breath was coming back. I mean, you could, and I'll, whoa, I touched my face. I mean, it was, you could feel it. It was like a coat of darkness. And my son was like, he was, I don't know, 12 or 13. He's like, Dad, that's not funny. Turn the light on. Come on, Dad. And I'm like, Dad, Dad. And then I put the light under my chin. Ah! <laughs> Because, you know, guys like the kid with each other and their kids. But it was just that darkness you could feel. And yet in Goshen, sun's out, shining. But you could, you could probably be in that enveloped darkness. And if you could walk through it and step out, you'd be into this light. I mean, it's like Dorothy going into Oz type thing or something. It's just weird. This felt darkness. And even that, there were times when Pharaoh seemed to let the people go. And then after the plague was gone, he hardened his heart. But well, there was one more. And that was the plague of the death of the firstborn of all of Egypt, from Pharaoh all the way down to the captive in the dungeon. It didn't matter. If you were in prison, you were not safe from having your firstborn die. Now, that could happen to all the children of Israel, too, believe it or not. But the Hebrew firstborn were not killed because they observed the first Passover. God sent the destroyer, as it's called in Exodus 12, 23, to kill the firstborn of not only man, but also beast. Whatever was left, the firstborn would also be killed unless they had the blood of the lamb from the Passover meal. So they would get the lamb. They would inspect it for blemishes. This is the first time it ever happened. They wouldn't break any bones, which is why Jesus' legs weren't broken when he was on the cross, which we'll get into later in Luke And so they would kill the the lamb and they would take the blood and with the hyssop, they would put it on the doorposts and across the lentil, which is the big wooden header over the top. And the destroyer would come and he would pass over any house that he saw the blood on the door and the lentil and move on. That's where the term Passover comes from. They were saved by the blood of the lamb. If you don't see the parallel there with Jesus, I don't... Hello? (laughs) Because we are saved by the blood of the Lamb because what would give us the second death is removed by the blood, which is very similar. you got blood on here, blood on this side from his hands, right? 
and then the blood from his head and everything, the wounds and the cross. I mean, it's a perfect parallel. But anyway, the blood of Jesus shed on the cross saves us from the second death because we are in him. So that's the background on the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, and that's why they celebrated it so much because God did such a mighty work. So all this is going on, all this wonderful stuff, all this good stuff, And then comes darkness, verse 2. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. We need to emphasize a word. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. In other words, they were going to kill him. They just got to figure out how. And the reason they can't do it right now, they think, is because there are so many people. They really wanted Jesus to be gone, but they had a problem because it was determined that For every 10 people, it was represented one lamb would be slain in Jerusalem. Now, the uh, historian Josephus from that time tells us that 265,500 lambs were slain on that Passover. That's a lot. That means that this Passover, over 2.6 million people were crowded in and around Jerusalem. And we know from the Gospels that Jesus was very popular with the common people. Isn't that amazing? He isn't very popular with the common people now. I mean, the people in general. But he was at that time. And the chief priests and the scribes are very aware of this, so they had a problem. How can we kill this guy without upsetting the people? There's so many. We'd be in big trouble. We can't do that. So they decided to wait until after the Passover when a lot of the people leave and it'd be a lot easier. Matthew tells us this in 26 verse 5. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So here they have a problem. They have no idea what is about to just basically drop in their laps. And we find that in verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. Well, this certainly explains why Judas would do such a horrible thing. Because Judas wasn't possessed by just any old garden variety demon. It was Satan himself, the leader, the top dog of the evil ones, right? So I believe there's something I want to take a side note here and discuss. Can a Christian be demon possessed? Some people wonder about that. A lot of people wonder. Some people believe one way or the other. It sounds like it here. Because Judas was what? He was numbered among the 12. He was in the inside group. He hung around Jesus literally in person for like three years. He he was with Jesus when Jesus sent out the disciples in pairs and they did great things. They witnessed, they healed the sick. They did all kinds of wonderful miracles for Jesus. They cast out demons. They came back and they said, hey, demons are subject to us. And Jesus is like, that's good, but rejoice for this, that your name's written in the book of life in heaven, not that demons obey you, you know? In other words, rejoice that you're saved. Is what he was saying. But anyway, that's a side note of a side note. (laughs) Doesn't that make Judas a Christian? Well, I have a statement for you from an old cartoon. Hold on there, Baba Louie. (laughs) Because just being around Jesus, just hanging around Jesus, doesn't make you a Christian. That's not the key. You can come to church. You can carry your Bible. You can sing the songs, talk the language. You can even pray. But unless you repent which means take your life and do a 180 change, go toward the Lord, ask Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You're not saved, despite how you act, despite how you look on the outside. So, can a Christian be demon-possessed? I've never seen a scripture that says word for word, no, but in all the New Testament passages dealing with spiritual warfare, there are no instructions on how to cast a demon out of a believer. It says we are to resist the devil, but not to cast him out. Christians are dwelt by the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ bled and died so people can get saved. It's hard for me to imagine someone who's saved, someone who's in Christ, and he allows the devil to come in and dwell too. Side by side? Now, I don't think Jesus plays well with others when the other one is the devil, (laughs) okay? So I would say, can a Christian be demon-possessed based on the scriptures and all the parallel passages back and forth? The conclusion we can come to is no. So what about Judas? It says right here, 
Satan entered him. He was devil-possessed. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 24, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. In other words, I'm going to go. I'm going to die as it's been prophesied. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Can you imagine Jesus saying that about you, any of us? Be better for you if you weren't even born. I mean, I've heard people say that about people, but never heard God say that about anybody but one. So it kind of puts Judas in an interesting light. John 6, verse 70 and 71. Did I not choose you, Jesus said, the twelve? And one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. It doesn't sound like Jesus has any hope for the salvation of Judas. Then you might say this, well, didn't Judas regret betraying Jesus? Didn't he feel badly? Because we read in Matthew 27, 3 through 5, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, meaning Jesus was condemned to death, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Judas did feel badly. He felt very badly. But you see, he only felt badly. We have no record of him repenting or seeking out the disciples for forgiveness or asking God. We know he couldn't get to Jesus. I think it was too late for that. Jesus was now being held you know, in uh, custody and eventually was going to be crucified. No scripture we have tells us that Judas asked for forgiveness. Because if he had, I believe it would have been a major storyline. And I think that Jesus would have done it if he'd asked. But he didn't. So what does he do? Verse 4, he went his way after he was possessed by Satan. He went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. This is probably Tuesday before Passover. Now, Judas would have taken off by himself with the chief priests and the captains and meeting with them. Now, for him to go off by himself, that wasn't unusual. John thirteen twenty nine, when Jesus himself said, Go, this is in the upper room, and he tells him, basically, go, it's time for you to betray me. I mean, that's what he's meaning. The disciples thought this. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Isn't that weird? Jesus says, the one who dips with the hand in the bread with me is my betrayer. And then he says, go and do what you're going to do quickly. Oh, maybe he's going out to buy something or give something to the poor. I mean, and I'm not picking on him. I shouldn't. I think Judas was popular. I think Judas was one of the guys. I think they liked him. I think they thought highly of him at this point in time. In fact, we know, in fact, it says they found out what he was like in John 12, 6. This he said, because when the woman anointed Jesus with the oil, his feet for his burial, and Judas said, hey, why are we wasting that? We could have given it to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. So I think Judas, I know he basically he was their treasurer. You don't put somebody in charge of the money unless you think he's trustworthy, right? Why wouldn't they do, use Matthew? Wasn't Matthew used to, he's a tax collector. Wasn't he used to dealing with cash? You know, it's like putting me in charge of the math instead of you. <laughs> that would just be dumb. <laughs> Because my slogan, right? Math, not even once. But he runs the mathnasium, so he knows all about it. So it would make sense. But Jesus put Judas in charge of the money, so they figured he's got to be trustworthy. I'm sure they were caught off guard totally. So Judas went to the chief priest secretly and the scribes to betray Jesus. It wouldn't be hard for him to get away. He normally did that. Now, how did they react? Oh, verse 5, and they were glad. And I said, I bet they were. They got help from an unexpected source. This all of a sudden became an inside job. (laughs) They're rubbing their hands together. And they agreed to give him money. Now, whose idea was it to pay Judas? Which one of those leaders thought we can give him some money as a reward, like a kickback? Won't that be nice? Well, Matthew 26, 15 tells us, Judas asked them, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. 
Judas is the one who asked them for money. And they agreed. This is another reason I believe Judas wasn't saved. He put money above his relationship with Jesus. Here he is betraying Jesus, and he goes to them and he says, you know, I can tell you when and where he'll be when you can get at him without people around. But how much is in it for me? How much are you going to give me for that information? Jesus himself said in Matthew 6, verse 24 in the NIV, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And it sure appears that Judas loved money more than he loved Jesus. And he traded a relatively small amount for the Savior of the world. Exodus 21.32 tells us that 30 pieces of silver is the price of a slave killed by an ox who has tended to thrust its horns in the past. In other words, if you had an ox, if you were the owner of an ox, and out of the blue it just went, whoa, and the horn skewered somebody and they died, well, that was an accident. But if it would tended to do that all the time or time to time, you know, once a month it would do it, or, and you knew it and didn't tell people, and they lost a slave because of it, well, then you had to pay for a new slave. What was the cost? 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for the price of a slave. But if you think about it, he did come as a slave. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man, Jesus himself said, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You think about the other parallel is this. The sacrifice, sacrificial lamb, a lot of times they buy one right? Jesus was purchased by them, and then they ended up killing him. Very interesting parallel. But anyway, where did the 30 pieces of silver come from? Well, the chief priests and the scribes and them, they would carry bags of money dedicated to the purchase of lambs for slaying as a sacrifice. This money came from the temple treasury. They used God's money to sacrifice God's son, and they did it in the name of religion. It's amazing what these guys were doing. So verse 6, So he promised that he would do it and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. This is another reason why they were so excited that Judas came to them. He would know both when and where to send them when Jesus would be away from the crowds. He would say, basically, here's the best time to come and get him. It also means that Judas was actively seeking out the best place, keeping his eyes open and his ears when they could come and arrest him. And all this time, pretending to be the friend of Jesus. He fooled 11 of the 12 guys. But the one he didn't fool was the one (laughs) nobody does, and he shouldn't have tried. So, verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. As I said, this is obviously a big deal for Israel. And William Barclay in his commentary says this, there were elaborate preparations for the Passover. Roads were repaired. Bridges were made safe. Wayside tombs were whitewashed, lest the pilgrims should fail to see them and so touch them and become unclean. Because it was, you become unclean not only if you touched a tomb, but if you even walked over one. So if someone buried in the ground, you walked over, or it'd be a hill and they'd, you'd walk over the top of it if it were in a cave, so they would whitewash it. So it would obviously, they'd see that and go, oh, that was white, so someone's dead. I don't want to be unclean, so I won't touch that. I won't walk across it. That's why Jesus said of the Pharisees, he says, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. You look nice on the outside, but inside, you're dead man's bones. Saying this, that's a common thing. You know what a whitewashed tomb is? That's what you guys are. Anyway, and then he says, Luke wrote, when the Passover must be killed, This is interesting that Jesus is our Passover lamb. In order to purchase our salvation, he must be killed. There's no other way. Hebrews 9.22 in the New Living Translation. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And to me, that is one of the greatest perks of Christianity is forgiveness of sin. And you don't get that without the shedding of blood. And, of course, it was the precious blood of Jesus that was shed. So in order for us to obtain that, Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, must be killed. So verse 8, so he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. 
Now, Jesus, we know, actually, we know that Jesus knows things the disciples don't. He proved that all through his life or his ministry, but he doesn't use his abilities as God, so to speak, to know them. Philippians 2 tells us he set aside his, well, for lack of a better term, what we call his powers as God, and he depended on the Holy Spirit to tell him everything. So it wasn't because he was God that he knew this stuff. It was because he had the Holy Spirit dwelling in him and the Holy Spirit told him. And the reason he did that is to be an example to us. You can do the same thing. That's why he says, you do these things and greater things than I will because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And here I believe what he's doing, this, the Holy Spirit told him what Judas is up to. So he's using Peter and John to keep the knowledge from Judas as to where they're going to have the Passover meal because it isn't time for him to suffer yet. So he doesn't want Judas to say, hey, he's going to be in an upper room. You can storm the place and get him. No problem. He didn't want him to do that. I think only Peter and John and Jesus knew where they were going to be ahead of time. So verse 9, they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? I think that's a logical question because in Jerusalem, many of the houses they'd have a, like a square bottom and they'd have an extra room upstairs with even an exterior staircase. And they would have their Passover meal in their part, and they would have the upper room, which is kind of like a bonus room in a lot of the houses we have today, where they could let other people use it, and they would do it for free. But it seems like a lot of these rooms would be taken up by now. I mean, you know, you plan ahead. You try to get, you know, maybe you want to make sure they leave the light on for you, right? Well, if it's not, it might be taken, and they'd offer it free of charge, though. So now Jesus gives them some interesting instructions here in verse 10. He said to them, Behold, when you have entered a city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Now you think, what's so interesting about this? Carrying water is not unusual. Carrying water in a pitcher seems like it'd be a good idea. But it was women who carried water in pitchers. If a man carried water, he would carry it in a, a bag made of animal skin. It's just the way it was done. So if a man carried water, it would be unusual and it would be easy to spot. Okay, so you'd know which guy and he would be going to that. Now, did Jesus set this up in advance? Did he tell the guy, okay, I'm going to send in my two. They're right over there. No, don't look now. Okay, now you can look. Don't look. Those two guys on the end, I'm going to send them in. When you see him, pick up the picture. I don't know, it may be. Or maybe the Holy Spirit told him, This is going to happen. It's certainly not beyond the realm of God and the capability of him to set this into motion where right when they walked in, the guy walked by. It happens to us probably more than we realize that God sets up what we call divine appointments or right when I got there, here's this guy. You know, so it's very simple. God can do anything. We aren't told exactly how it happened, but we know that it did. The next thing Jesus tells them is maybe a little more likely to be in prearranged. Verse 11, then you say to the master of the house after you enter there, The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? This kind of reminds me of earlier before Palm Sunday when Jesus, actually on Palm Sunday, Jesus sent sent him in, two of them and said, hey, you'll see when you go in there, there's a colt there, untie it, a donkey, a young donkey, and bring it to me. And if someone says, hey, why are you losing that colt? Say, hey, the Lord has need of him. And they're like, okay. So they go in there, they see the colt, they untie it. Hey, why are you unloosening that colt? Because the Lord has need. Okay. I mean, what an interesting way for all that to go down. This is very similar. They follow the guy with the pitcher. They go in there and say, where is the room where we can have the Passover of the teacher? Oh, it's up here. I'll show you. He just does it. It's really cool. The Lord has need of him. Anyway, so verse 12. Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. This is another one of those faith-building moments in the lives of Peter and John. They were witnesses to so many of the things that Jesus did. There were were three of them who saw the most. There was Peter, James, and John. This is Peter and John. And I bet that Peter and John, through the rest of their lives, thought about this thing every once in a while. And the reason I say that is because I've had things happen to me in my spiritual life that I think of once in a while that helped strengthen my faith. One example I've told you guys before, but some of you are visiting I was up in Garden Valley. I'll shrink this down. I was at a retreat, and they told us, after this teaching on Psalm 1, separate, go off by yourself, and meditate on it and pray. See what God tells you. Well, I went down by a stream, and here's a tree by the stream with the roots in the water. Well, in Psalm 1, it says, the man who meditates on the word of God day and night is like a tree planted by streams of water. 
I'm like, wow, God, that's exactly what it says. Look how big and powerful and strong that tree is. Okay. And then it says we are to meditate on God's word day and night. You know, you have to meditate on the word of God only twice a day. Isn't that pretty neat? Just day and night. That's all you have to do. So, <laughs> so anyway, so what, 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 was, what was God telling me? I realized, I was, so I said it out loud. I said, so you're telling me, and it was kind of foggy. I said, so you're telling me you want me to spend more time with you. Instantly, the fog went away, sunlight, oh! And I'm like, I mean, I didn't hear it, but it was like that. I was like, wow. And so every once in a while, I remember that. Do I need to spend more time with God? Oh, yep, okay. Just, just, just checking, you know? Will Jesus do what he said? Oh, yeah, okay. That's what, that's what Peter, <laughs> Peter and John would do. They would think of these things. So things happen to you, remember that later in life. Anyway, so verse 13. So they went and found it just as he said to them, and they prepared the Passover. I put in my notes, good for them. What did they do? They heard Jesus tell them what to expect. They saw it happen exactly as he said, and then they did something else. They obeyed him. There are people that will hear from Jesus. This is what will happen. Then they see it happen, then they don't obey. They're this close. It's like that video of those two little boys whose mom ate their candy, and it was like four bags worth. Okay, and the one kid said, that's two, and two plus two, and the younger one goes, five, and he goes, his brother goes, oh, you were so close. <laughs> you, know, you know, you're so close to doing the right thing. You hear from Jesus, you see it just as he said, and then, eh, I just can't obey. They did it, and they prepared the Passover. And there's one other thing I want to mention in closing, that's this. They went and found it just as he said to them. I believe this will be the case in everything you see in his word that Jesus tells you about. Whether it's something he tells you to obey, whether it's something that the Apostle Paul says we are to obey, writing by the um, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, or whatever. But whatever God says, whatever Jesus says, is going to happen and happen for you. When it says one day we will see him face to face, we will see him face to face. When it says that we will walk on streets that are like transparent gold, we'll walk on streets that are like transparent gold. And that city that has gates that are pearl, a big old gate made out of one pearl, wow, that's a big oyster, I don't know, but God can do it. When it says we will see him and see his face, we will. When it says we will hear from him, well done, we will. When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he won't. These are things we can take his word for it. Because in closing, num- I know, second closing, right? Numbers twenty three nineteen. Listen to this, though. Ready? Okay, this is really good. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? He's always carried through. He's always acted when he said. Okay, so now Passover prep has been made. Next time we get together, we'll take a look at the last Passover Jesus Christ ate on earth. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful instruction here. The fact that we can take you at your word. The fact that you may give us instructions that seem like, what? And then we go and we see it, and it's exciting, and it builds our faith. And we know that there will be people that look like Christians that talk like Christians. As that old saying goes, when the one guy said, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and talks like a duck, he says, it's not a duck. Ducks don't talk. People who act like Christians and aren't believers aren't. We need to just trust that to you. We aren't to judge, but we have to be aware that that may be a possibility. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you for dying on the cross and willingly lovingly going through this because you care about us so greatly. In Jesus' name, amen.